Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. Kim, um, obviously everyone knows you, like there's some famous pictures out there of you, you know, your shot A-10, but can you tell us about your time in live theatre and, you know, share that story, that famous story uh, for our viewers? Yeah. Yeah. So um, my first combat deployment, I fi so I finished my A-10 training at the end of 2001, Um so during 9-11, when 9-11 happened, I was in my A-10 training. I show up to my unit at Pope Air Force Base in North Carolina, the 75th Fighter Squadron. And we deployed a few months later to Afghanistan to support Operation um, Enduring Freedom. Um, and so that was my first combat experience. Um, about, I don't know, six months later, we turned around and we went to Iraq uh, to support Operation Iraqi Freedom. And I'll tell you, know, I was still a young wingman in the squadron. I mean, I was really new, fairly new to the A-10, all considering um, we weren't upgrading many pilots at that point because we were in combat and there just wasn't time. And so, um, you know, I was still one of the newer pilots to the squadron. And when we deployed to Iraq and uh, we left at the end of February 2003, I knew I was going but I, I wasn't even sure I was going to fly. I mean, we, they, wow. we took pilots to work in our mission planning cell. And so I thought maybe because I was inexperienced that maybe I would just work in the mission planning cell. Um, but then when we got our taskings um, and how busy we were, we needed every pilot that we could get. And so I did end up uh, flying and um, we flew starting, you know, once the war kicked off in mid-March, um, we flew close air support missions, uh, probably had flown 10 to 15 missions. Um, some of those were quiet missions where we would go out to, to support our ground troops. And honestly, they were moving so fast towards Baghdad that a lot of times uh, we would we would be there to support them, but there weren't necessarily any targets. Yeah. And then sometimes we would go out and it would be a very target rich environment um, taking out enemy threats. So the missions really varied. Uh, we also supported the Marines as well um, in their area of operations. Um, but it was it was exactly what we had been trained to do, which was close air yeah. support. Um, and then once our troops reached Baghdad, I feel like everything changed. I mean, it just they faced more resistance. There were more troops in contact calls where they were taking effective fire. And it really, really picked up. Um, and so on April 7th, 2003, uh, by that point, our ground troops had reached Baghdad. Um, there was significant threats in the area, and there was so much threat to our ground troops that they had started just stacking um, airplanes up around Baghdad. Right. So you would essentially, we'd take off from Kuwait, we'd fly up to Baghdad, we'd air refuel because for us that was 300, roughly 300 miles an hour of flight time, and we wanted to be fully loaded with gas yeah. before we went to support the troops. And so we got gas and then they just sent us to a point in the stack and we just wait. Um, unfortunately, the weather that day was terrible. Um, we couldn't see the ground below. And in fact, I remember my flight lead telling me like, I'm not even sure we're gonna be able to do anything today oh, because no. we couldn't see the ground, you know? And for us at the time, you know, we didn't have any capability unless we could get below the weather. And, um, so we just were waiting and just kind of chatting in the stack. It was fairly quiet. And then we got a call that um, a ground controller wanted us to go take a look at um, an area where he thought that the um, that there were some tanks and vehicles acting as a command post. And so we started heading in that direction and thinking, again, like, I don't know that we're going to be able to do anything. We can't mm -hmm. see below the clouds. And if we're just looking for something, we can't go down below the weather. And about that point, we got a call on the radio uh, from a ground controller and uh, you could 
definitely hear like the change in his voice because he nice. said, Hey, my guys are taking fire. We need immediate assistance. Uh, he gave us the coordinates and we immediately just proceeded right over the top of the coordinates. By this point, we could start seeing like a little bit of like, we could see like a, a little quick snapshot of the ground and then it would go away. We'd see a little snapshot of the ground and it would go away. And so um, my flight lead kind of got us ready to go. He said, all right, we're going to plan to go in with guns. We were given a target to strike, which was um, underneath the North Baghdad Bridge where the Iraqi Republican Guard was hiding and uh, shooting rocket propelled grenades into our troops. And he said, all right, we're going to go in with guns. Are you ready? He said, one's ready. And I was like, okay, two's ready. Like, okay, well, you know, shit, you know, this is it. Like, this is yeah. what we train for. And I remember watching him and he just kind of disappeared through the clouds. He found a hole and just disappeared through. Um, and then, you know, I remember kind of looking down and looking for that hole in the clouds. And I just, I saw it and I dove through. As soon as I popped out down below the weather and now, I mean, we're low. Um, we're, we're lower than we normally are. Um, I could see the firefight. I mean, it was, it was very, I don't know, surreal is the word I can find because yeah. like you think of this, you think of what you might see, but I mean, I could see this firefight. I had never really been like over the top of a firefight that low. Yeah. Um, and I could see the tracers and smoke and, you know, going back and forth across the river. Um, luckily the, the river was nice and identifiable and we could <laughs> see our target with the bridge. I mean, if I think about the good things, That's something. um, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, the friendlies were on one side, the enemy was on the other. And so we had a very identifiable feature to help us out there. Um, but I remember seeing this firefight, you know, it was just smoke and tracers and, and just flashes. It was just, it was very intense. Um, and my flight lead is setting up to use guns um, on the enemy location. And then I just remember seeing all of a sudden like these puffs of gray and white smoke and then bright flashes. And I realize, you know, now they're next to my cockpit, right? Not, oh, no. not only is there this firefight happening across the ground, but now they're, they're shooting at us too. Um, but we had a mission to do. I mean, the guys needed our help and we were gonna go down and, and do what we could to help them out. Um, at about that point, my flight lead uh, used gun on the enemy location and the ground controller said, not effective. I need you to come in from south to north. Um, and so we, I aborted my run and we reset up. Um, and at this point, it is a very intense firefight happening. You know, there's, we can see AAA, we can see, um, you know, it's an intense area where we know that we are at risk as well. And so we decide we're just going to do a couple passes because we want to put fire down on the enemy location as quickly as we can. Uh, so immediately uh, we each do uh, two passes and we use uh, our 30 millimeter Gatling gun to get underneath the bridge and then also some high explosive rockets again to get underneath the bridge without doing damage to the bridge itself or to the surrounding civilian infrastructure that at some point our troops are going to need to use. And so I, I set up for my last pass and, you know, Kind of like I talked about, you know, learning the A-10 for the first time. I'm trying to nail my altitude, my airspeed, get right on my parameters. I fine-tune my aim point as I put my um, point my nose right underneath the the bridge, uh, hit the weapons release button, and then immediately pull off, just trying to get away from the ground, away from the threat. And then I just, I mean, I could hear this huge explosion at the back of the airplane, and it was like a bright flash. I knew immediately I was hit. I mean, there is no doubt in my mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. The jet nosed over. I remember, like, I remember seeing Baghdad. I remember very clearly, like, looking down at the river below. I remember pulling back on my control stick, and um, and nothing happened. Like nothing. The airplane is not responding, and it's just diving down towards Baghdad. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, I know, you know, I. I know that I'm going to, you know, this is going to turn out a couple of ways. And again, time is slowing down at this point, but I'm either going to crash, which is not going to go well, obviously, <laughs> uh, or I can eject, which is also not going to go well in my mind, you know, ejecting where we were just engaged with the enemy it, um, has the potential to go poorly. <laughs> uh, and so I'm just so focused on getting that airplane under control. And I remember like master caution lights flashing at me. I remember um, trying to isolate my hydraulic systems to prevent, you know, I, at this point, I'm not sure what's going on, but that's one of the things we do after battle damage. I remember looking down at my caution panel and I could just see like 
so many lights. Uh, and then the top four lights were the ones that were most concerning to me, which were the hydraulic pressure and reservoir lights um, for the left and right side. And they were all on. And I remember looking up at the the gauges, the hydraulic gauges that are just above that, and they're both at zero. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's just kind of this instant realization of like, it the system's empty. Like it, my hydraulics are gone. Oh, yeah. So at that point, uh, the, you know, now I've got really two options. I eject, which, like I said, not really my first choice. Um, and so in my mind, there's really only one choice. And that's going to our backup emergency system, which is called manual reversion. Um, And it's a backup system. It's a switch. I mean, it's a switch on the left side of the cockpit panel. I remember flipping that switch and pulling back on the stick and finally like the airplane starts to climb up. And uh, that's the, I think that's the first moment for me where I was like, okay, I think I, I think I can get out of here alive. Um, But yeah. Um, there was a lot going on all at the same time. And, um, I don't know, it was probably that one of the toughest, toughest things that I've ever gone through. Um, but I'm, I'm really thankful for the training that I had, you know, that in that moment I could kind of go through my basic aircraft skills of like maintain aircraft control. Well, that's not happening. Um, but analyze the situation and then take the proper action, Um, you know, you just kind of go back to the basics of trying to get the airplane under control, figuring out what's going on and then take action. And, um, you know, that's exactly what I did. Um, I didn't do it alone. I mean, I had a flight lead with me and when I told him I was hit, when I keyed the mic and said, two got hit, two got hit. Um, actually what I said was shit, two got hit, (laughs) two got hit, um, which is what you're not supposed to say on the radio. Yeah, Yeah. That's okay. Uh, when I told him that I was hit, he immediately told me to come West because in his mind I had been hit and he wanted me over the friendly location on the West side of the Tigris river. So that if I had to eject, I would at least be over the friendlies. Um, he also told me to put out more chaff and flare because, you know, ideally they're not going to hit me again. And then, uh, he also, once I told him that I was in manual reversion, um, he, I think at that point he realized how serious the situation yeah. was. And he told me to emergency jettison everything off the airplane. So we have one button, everything comes off the airplane in a safe mode. Uh, but that is what allowed me to climb up. So full team effort. That's why we fly with a wingman. Absolutely. But uh, just can I ask him on a human level, did you think, oh shit, um, I don't know if you had family at the time, but did anything race in your head? Like, oh God, you know, my mom and dad, you know, wife and kids, whatever you, uh, uh, husband, kids, yeah. whatever you. Not, not in that moment, right. um, because I think I was so focused on right. everything else. Um, I was just really trying to get the airplane under control. Once I got out of Baghdad, right? Like once I recovered the airplane, it's flying, I'm in manual reversion. My flight lead says, he, he tells the ground guys that we have to leave um, because I had been hit. Um, and we start making our way home, that is when like the mind starts wandering, right? Because in manual reversion, um, we have essentially two decisions. I can fly the airplane back to friendly territory and land or, um, get it back and eject. And, um, that was a tough decision. That was like, you know, what's the right answer, right? Ejecting, which is relatively safe, uh, kind of. Um, (laughs) And then there's, you know, landing an airplane that's pretty beat up. And that was that was a hard decision. Um, And so flying that hour back to home base back to Kuwait was was a a tough hour. Um, I'm one, I'm trying to get a feel for how my airplane's flying, but I'm also trying to make this decision. And so it's really hard to focus, um, to, to maintain focus on just solely on flying the airplane because my mm-hmm. mind is trying to wander to like, what if I crash, you know, you know, yeah. cause I'm trying to, I'm trying to make a decision. So I'm, I'm thinking of the worst case scenarios. And so it, you know, at the time I didn't have kids. Um, that was certainly something that I wanted to do that hadn't, hadn't done yet. Um, yes. you know, I was married. Um, and so it's like, we, we call it compartmentalization, right? I had to compartmentalize. I had to push those thoughts out. Like I I just couldn't go there. Yeah. And so compartmentalize those thoughts and just totally focus on flying the airplane. Um, Easier said than done, right? Because I could feel my mind wander and I would just 
try to bring it right back in and think about, you know, I'd go through another emergency checklist. I would go through just talking with my flight lead and going through the discussion of, do I land, you know, do I eject? Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I'd be lying if I said those thoughts didn't creep in, but yeah. I tried to n- not think about them after I landed and got out of the airplane and looked at the damage and keep in mind the airplanes on the runway at this point, because I yeah. couldn't taxi clear. I left it on the runway. Um, I've, I'm surrounded by a bunch of Marines who are the firefighters who met me at the jet and I hop out and I look in this airplane and it is like dripping with hydraulic fluid. There are holes everywhere. You know, there's a foot by, football size hole. Um, I think that works for the US and the UK. Uh, a football <laughs> size <laughs> hole in that back horizontal stabilizer. And, um, you know, it's just, and it's charred. It's covered, you know, with dripping hydraulic fluid while it's like the back is blackened and yeah. soft to the touch. I mean, it was more like shock and amazement, like that this airplane took this much damage and could yeah. still keep flying. It was, uh, yeah, it was, I, I was shocked when I got out and looked at the airplane because I couldn't see the damage when I was flying. I mean, we have these mirrors in our cockpit, but I couldn't, I couldn't aim them back enough. So I had no idea what the damage looked like. And, uh, yeah, shock and amazement and thankfulness that I was flying the A-10, right? That it was designed yeah. and built, uh, to take those kind of hits, um, I don't think the adrenaline wore off till later that night. I think that's when it really all hit me. Yeah, I can imagine no sleep for that night. <laughs> no, I I must have slept because I flew the next day. I mean, I you clearly flew the had next to. Day. I did. Yeah, wow. I was. Act- yeah, I I don't wasn't supposed to. Um, I was tasked with sitting combat search and rescue alert, and so normally when you sit CSAR alert, uh, you sit in a shack next to the runway and. You sleep, you read, you you know whatever. You catch up on rest, um, but unfortunately, an A ten pilot got shot down, and so we got launched. Yeah. You know the alarm sounded, and we raced out to the jets as fast as we could, got on our gear, immediate takeoff, and then just began like asking all the questions: What shot him down? Where's he at? What's his condition? Where are the closest rescue helicopters? You know, those guys were there for me the day before, right? The rescue crews were there, the Sandy pilots, which is what we call our A-10 CSAR crews. Um, they were there for me the day before, and so I was going to do the same for this pilot. Um, we made it about 30 minutes into Iraq, and then uh, we were told we could turn around, uh, which we did not do at first. <laughs> I don't know what we're thinking, like the... The AWACS, uh, the airborne warning system that with the radar, obviously they can see us like we're not fooling anybody. Yeah. Uh, but we just kept pressing and they finally said, hey, you know, Sandy flight, you can turn around. He's he's been picked up. Uh, and it turns out he was picked up by friendly ground troops. Um, so he was very lucky. Uh, but that was my return to the airplane um, was getting launched on a combat search and rescue mission. I mean, what a story to wrap up uh, the A-10 part, <laughs> but <laughs> wow. So I hope you enjoyed that, folks. But uh, yeah, uh, Kim, how many hours did you actually get on the A-10? Uh, I have about 1,800 hours in the A-10. Nice. So about, I think, uh, over 100 combat missions um, in Iraq and Afghanistan and about 1,800 hours in the airplane. Not bad. Not bad at all. No, not bad. Not bad uh, for someone that started flying a little later uh, than exactly, most. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I love that airplane. I mean, I, I miss flying it. I, I finished out my career, as I mentioned, uh, flying the Cirrus uh, yes. SR-20 at the Air Force Academy, which is just a, an opportunity to uh, take our cadets out and teach them a little bit about flying, get them excited about flying and share some more stories, too. Uh, so we got, uh, I, I'm going to, I think we got one uh, question from our patron here and then a few personal questions if sure. you're happy with that, Kim. So yeah. this is from Joe Kunzler. So when was your final flight and how did it go? <laughs> uh, my final flight, uh, let's see, it was July of 2018. Um, I was um, at back at Davis Monthan, which was fitting. Um, so at the time I was, uh, also a group commander. Um, so in charge of about a thousand people throughout South America, Central America wow. and the Caribbean and, uh, flying, flying was like a bonus for me. I, I did not think I would be able to fly as a Colonel, right. um, in this job. And, um, you know, I got an incredible opportunity to be able to fly, um, in the A-10 again and instruct in the A-10 again. So I was pretty excited about that. 
Um, but my final flight, uh, I flew with uh, some of the guys, a uh, four ship of A-10s, uh, some of the guys that I had flown with on my very first A-10 assignment with the 75th oh, cool. Fighter Squadron, which was pretty cool to kind of come full circle with that. Yeah. And uh, we went out on the mission with the sole goal of uh, uh, trying to uh, stay at 100 feet for as long as we could on the mission. <laughs> we went low altitude out to the range. Uh, it, based on uh, some of the rules, we obviously couldn't be that low over uh, the city of Tucson. But once we got to the range, we could we dropped down to 100 feet, stayed at 100 feet, um, did a low altitude mission, uh, got to shoot the gun again uh, on the last mm-hmm. ride. So just popping up enough over ridges to shoot the gun uh, so cool. and then coming back home. And it was a little sad, actually, like coming up initial, leading my four ship up initial. So right over the top of the runway and then watching, you know, them all um, land. And I, I was the last one to land. Um, but I remember just taxing in and seeing everybody there waiting for me. And it was a little sad, you know, in many ways, like, what a amazing opportunity that I had. And um, did you get just, the champagne sprayed all over you? Yeah, <laughs> champagne, <laughs> uh, the fire bottles with my my kids uh, yeah. did that. And, but you know, I just I think about like all the, it kind of gave me a chance to reflect right on yes. everything that I had done and just the the impact that we had made. And yeah, um, I guess I missed probably one of the best parts was walking out to the airplane. Um, that morning um, to launch and uh, I got out to the airplane and on the A-10 um, to get in the airplane, it requires you to climb up the ladder to get yeah. in the airplane. And so there's a door that covers the ladder. But when we walk out to the airplane, the ladder ah, door is yes, open. Say, yeah. And uh, I walk out to the airplane and there um, on the the ladder door is uh, some new art that the squadron had created so for cool. me. And it's actually uh, behind me here. Um, they created a uh, personal ladder door art for me as a picture of me. Um, my call sign is killer chick. So, uh, that says the killer on there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just go by KC, but to walk up to that jet and see that ladder door, art, it was just such a, I don't know. It was just such a tribute, uh, that, you know, my squadron did that for me and just Amazing. kind of brought my whole career into perspective of what yeah. they were, you know, what they did. And then after the mission, they, I, once I landed, they actually uh, gave me the ladder door art as my farewell gift. So now I have it here in my office. Absolutely amazing, Kim. <laughs> yeah, and you pretty, find it amazing. pretty awesome way to end it. I still miss it. I would go back in a heartbeat, but a uh, pretty good way to end it. Absolutely. So I've got a few personal questions to wrap up here, Kim. So um, yeah. do you have any hobbies? Uh, yeah, I mean, I have young kids, so I spend a lot of time um, with them. But uh, I absolutely love to ski. I love the outdoors. Um, I um, love to hike. I'm in Colorado. So uh, yeah. I try to get uh, my goal is 52 hikes and 52 weeks uh, wow. for the year. So I nice. managed to, to nail that last year. Um, but yeah, I love I love being outside. I love hiking and skiing. And uh, as you might guess for skiing, I, I like to uh, push myself a little bit on the slopes. I'm always a fan of finding the uh, double black diamonds and the open shoots and the uh, the the backside of ski areas. But uh, yeah, those are probably my favorite things to do. Nice. And um, this is probably an easy one for you, but uh, we ask all our interviewees uh, this one. But uh, favorite aircraft you have flown? Oh, well, that's easy. <laughs> it's the A-10. Yeah. It's the Warthog by far. Absolute favorite aircraft that I've flown. Uh, I, I don't think anything would ever beat it. Is there an aircraft you would love to fly either past or present? <sighs> that's a really good question. There's so many. I would love to, like, I go, I think I would go back to like World War II vintage. Like, I think probably anything in that era, I think would be really cool. Um, bombers, fighters. Yeah. I don't know. I think it would all be really cool. Okay. I'm going to pin you down to one because or, everyone or the says. Space shuttle. Or the space shuttle. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> right. That's interesting. Uh, but I'm not, uh, everyone says World War II, you know, Spitfire Mustang, but I'm going to like, push you to pick one from like you know cold war era or some sort of modern jet oh like a modern jet what i would fly oh i'd fly i'd love to fly the f-35 i think that would be awesome oh wow right that's cool yeah i'd love to see like the difference in technology just in terms of like 
you know, where we came from and where we're, where we're at with a new technology. Um, we sent a lot of A-10 pilots to the F-35 community yes. because we want the F-35 community to be good air to ground and supporting our <laughs> ground troops. So yeah, if you want to pin me down on one, I think, I think if I were to go back in time, maybe the P-51 forward in time, the F-35. So Kim, what are you currently up to and can we find you online? Yes, uh, absolutely. I, so I retired in August of 2021. Uh, so gosh, not even a year ago. Uh, it seems like, you know, it seems like it's been a while, but, um, I am now, um, doing keynote speaking, sharing, sharing my story and sharing some of the lessons learned. Um, you know, I look back on that mission and so much of that impacted my life. It impacted my career. It impacted me as a person, you know, as a mom and a wife. And yeah. I just think, you know, there's so many lessons learned that I love to share that I think relate to people's personal and professional lives, you know, to business as well. And so I'm doing keynote speaking. I'm also doing some executive coaching. Uh, I finished out my career um, at the Air Force Academy, again, coming full circle. I was there as the director for the Center for Character and Leadership Development. And so I'm I'm very passionate about leadership um, and uh, teaching, especially our younger de- generation, how to lead with courage. Um, and so I, I do speaking on that now, uh, as well as coaching for senior executives. And so you can find me um, online. I've got a, a website where people can find me. It's www.kim-casey-campbell.com. Um, I'm, I'm on Twitter as well at KC Hogg, H-A-W-G 987. Um, and uh, at LinkedIn as well. You can find me there as kim casey campbell uh, And I'd love to connect with people. I'd love to, to get your messages. Um, um, I share some videos about my thoughts and experiences on YouTube as well. Um, but I, I love to get the messages and the personal notes as well. Um, it just, I, I think it's important that we all connect and share those lessons learned. Yeah, actually, I'm really excited to announce that um, I've been working on a book with uh, five other authors uh, who are uh-huh. all pilot, pilots um, in the Air Force. And so our book called Aiming Higher, uh, which is a journey through military aviation leadership, uh, comes out on uh, the 17th of May. Um, and it's really a collection of stories and lessons about leadership that we've learned through our time as aviators in the Air Force. Um, so you get a little cross section of different airframes nice. um, and different backgrounds and experiences. But um, it was a fun project to work on because it gave us some time to reflect, um, to share some stories. I talk a little bit about Red Flag in there as well and that Lynn. that journey, that experience. Um, but it's a, it's a a great opportunity to share some experiences with some other pilots as well and the things that we learned. So it's called aiming higher and it, uh, is out on 17 May. Is that going to be hardback or is it on Kindle as well? Yes, it will be, uh, it will be first available, uh, in paperback and then we'll be pushing it out in other formats later on. Absolutely. And I'll link, uh, Kim's, uh, uh, Twitter, everything she mentioned there uh, in the description below. But uh, Kim, thank you very much for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much for having me. You made it fun. It was easy. (laughs) Uh, Cheers. (laughs) All right. Take care.